So welcome, Professor John Dreisek. He's a professor at the Center of Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra. Before that, he was a professor of political science at the Australian National University. He's a former head of political science departments at the University of Oregon and the University of Melbourne. His work centers on both political theory and empirical social science, and he's best known for his contributions in the area of democratic theory and practice and environmental politics. He's published eight, he's published eight books on the matter, and in today's interview, we'll be discussing his book, The Politics of the Earth, Environmental Discourses. It was first published in 1997. Several editions have been published since, and it continues to have a profound impact over 25 years later. So thank you very much for coming on, uh, Professor John. Really, really love you to have you here. Let's just get okay, into great. it. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Um, first well, question is just, can you tell us a bit more about your background? What got you interested in politics, uh, democracy, and the environmental politics? Yeah, good question. Uh, so, uh, well, I, I, I mean, I, I grew up in England a long time ago. Uh, it feels like a long time ago now. Um, and in terms of how I got interested in the, in, in the environment, I, I think it was, well, I, I suppose I, you know, I was a teenager in the late 60s, and this was in, in some ways a sort of the first wave of environmental concern and, uh, uh, and living in the uh, English countryside, I, I saw lots of... Uh, threats to uh and, and lots of damage being caused to the to the local environment and so it was really sort of based on that sort of local experience and then trying to think how this resonated at a larger level that i first got interested in uh in environmental questions um and in those days well i went to university in uh, in in 1971 and uh in those days um environmental studies uh and especially environmental social science didn't really exist and uh so uh I, I ended up um, doing doing politics at, uh, at at university, and and I think I was sort of seek, seeking a way to integrate uh, a concern with uh, concern with the environment with a concern with um, governance and what to what to do about it. But as I say, the field didn't really exist. The, the field of environmental politics didn't really exist in in those days, um, and so it was uh, only um, sort of gradually that um, that it became possible to sort of pursue this joint interest in. Uh, in politics and the environment, um, and eventually sort of managed um, in my uh, PhD I did at the University of Maryland in the in the US, where I was very lucky to have uh, Oren Young, who's one of the pioneers in this field, as a as a as a mentor and and PhD supervisor. And then, in a way, it just it sort of developed from there. And so I, I have been working on environmental politics for well uh, several decades now. All right, and in 1997, you published a book called Politics of the Earth, Environmental Discourses. Now, this is before climate change or, uh, is like a big thing now. Um, this is probably, I mean, you have, uh, in those times, you have the ozone layer issues and um, maybe a little bit about global warming. So what prompted you to write this book on environmental discourses at that time? Yeah, so I'd been teaching environmental politics uh, for uh, for some years by, by then, and the you're right. The climate change wasn't quite the dominant issue that it uh, that it eventually became, and in some ways, climate change has, has subsumed uh, almost all of environmentalism at times. And I'm not I'm not sure that's actually a, a necessarily a positive thing. I mean, climate change, of course, is important, but it's only one aspect of Earth system change. Um, but uh, yeah, so the the book was really based on the way I I'd been teaching environmental politics um, over over the. Uh, well, probably around for, for around ten years bef before the, the before the first edition came out, um, and so in terms of actually what prompted me to write in the in the in the first instance, it was actually a meeting with uh, uh, an editor at Oxford University Press, um, Tim Barton, uh, who uh, suggested, well, why not just uh, write a book based on your lecture notes? And I did, and. Uh, in, it wasn't the first book I'd written on environmental politics, but it was the first one to use the the, the discourse approach. And uh, one one way of, I mean, if, as I look back over my career, I, I guess I've been sort of struggling to sort of find, really sort of find the the key to positive change when it comes to um, environmental governance. And uh, this, in, in a sense, represents the, the discourse iteration uh, that before that I'd been more concerned with the the, the structure the structure of uh, institutions, and then at different times have also looked at the the, the role of uh, the role of social movements. 
Um, but I think all of these things are important and all have a part to play. And so the, the kind of lens I use in, in this book is, uh, I think, a powerful one for both understanding the history of environmental concern and environmental governance and also its possible future. Uh, but but it's not the only it, it's not the only lens. Um, there are others. And I think they all as I, say, I think they all have a, a part to play. And for my audience who's not very, they're not academics, right? They're no, normal people. What is an environmental discourse? Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll start with the, the idea of a discourse in general, because environmental discourses are just one kind of one kind of discourse. Um, so the, the word discourse is used a lot in social science. Uh, and in that there are there are many different uh, conceptions and many different definitions. Um, so my own definition is is perhaps a bit of a, a mouthful, uh, but it's basically a, a discourse is a, a, a shared well. I'll, I'll, this is more or less a quote from the book: um, a shared way of apprehending or understanding the world, uh, embedded in language that people jointly use. So it means that um, people who share a discourse can can. Uh, put together uh, coherent accounts of that world, and they can interpret the the information that they they receive in the light of the discourse. Um, so a discourse uh, helps to define uh, the, the the terms in which people engage each other. It's a, it's it's as I say, it's a, it's a kind of a shared set of understandings. Um, discourses uh, both enable communication amongst people who who subscribe to a particular discourse but they also constrain communication because they 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 understand the world in a particular way that rules out that that, that can rule out other ways of understanding the world so that's a bit a bit abstract um and so i think it will become more concrete as we talk about uh, particular environmental discourses but uh as i say environmental discourses are just one kind of discourse um they they just uh to, but to me, they're a very important kind of discourse. Um, the environment is not just an air, just one area of politics or policy. You know, we just—it's not just something where we can say, "Oh, oh, let's uh, let's appoint a minister for the environment and let them deal with this uh, little little sort of niche aspect of of government." Uh, for me, the it is the backdrop. The environment is the backdrop to everything. Um, it's anything to do with the earth system on which ultimately we all depend. And so it is much more than simply one area of governance. I think it uh, uh, it should uh, it should be a concern in when it comes to governance in its entirety. Yeah, um, and I suppose you could think of discourse in a way of, it's like a shared community who have a shared vernacular about mm -hmm. a particular subject. A bit yeah. like online communities, like on Reddit or something, they have this kind of way of thinking about a particular yeah. thing in the world, and they have that yeah, shared yeah, vocabulary, right? Yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. So that's that's yeah. kind of like a discourse. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in your book, you meant you have about I think nine discourses, and there's but there's four main categories. Could you right. touch a little bit on those? What they are, the main yeah. uh, discourses in environmental uh, politics. Yeah. So um, there, there are yeah four four main categories. Um, now, how did I come up with these? The, I, I, I think um, if if I were doing it today, I, I wouldn't necessarily do the same thing. But uh, twenty, I'm trying to think how many years ago now, 20, 25 years or so ago, it, uh, it actually more than that now. It made um, it, it it made sense. And what I what I was what I tried to do what I tried to do is uh, um, in the beginning of the book is um, is is try and develop a sort of in, in some ways a deductive category of discourses. And it's it's based on um, it, it's really based on a, well it's deductive but it's also historically grounded. And the history goes something like this: um, prior to the late sixties, people didn't use the term environment or environmentalism. Now, things that we can recognise now as being part of the environment were really important. So uh, things like uh, pollution, for example, was uh, was was, was recognised. Um, uh, but the but the but the encompassing term environment um, really really wasn't. And I think what we what we had instead was a taken for granted discourse of what uh, uh, my colleague um, Douglas Torgerson um, referred to as industrialism, which really uh, sort of took for granted the benefits of, of of economic growth and ideologies as disparate as uh, 
as uh, conservatism and Marxism would uh, would really take the desirability of technological progress, economic growth uh, for, for granted, and saw the the growth of the growth and development of the industrial system as central to that. And so that is a, in some ways a, an overarching discourse uh, that was pretty much taken for granted. There was no need even to name it uh, because everyone everyone subscribed to it. And that, oh, by the way, that's a, a difference between a discourse and an ideology. Um, a, a discourse can be taken for granted. An ideology, I think, has to be consciously adopted. You, you know if you're a socialist or a liberal or a conservative or, I see. or whatever. Yeah. Um, a discourse, um, you don't have to be aware of that. Um, so... Environmentalism arises in opposition to industrialism and arrives with, with, a, with, a, with a social movement, really, in the, in, the, in the 1960s. And there's, of course, been many developments since. And so I tried to categorize discourses in terms of um, how they departed from the previ previously dominant discourse of industrialism. And so I categorized them uh, in a, I have this sort of two by two uh, uh, table and uh, to try and categorize the, the main discourses and so the on on one axis it's reformist versus radical um reformist things we can just change things we just need to change things um gradually incrementalism incrementally within the confines of the existing political economic systems um radical thinks that more drastic change is necessary and then so so that that's perhaps not very controversial the other axis uh <laughs> sometimes causes people a bit of trouble because uh, it, the, the two categories on the other axis are what I call um, prosaic and imaginative. Um, prosaic means essentially sort of taking the, the way the chessboard is set by existing institutions and practices um, for, for, for granted. Um, whereas imaginative seeks to, uh, well, think in, think in new ways, if you like. It's, it's not the same as radical because imaginative can also involve imaginative thinking about um, reformist ways of doing things. And so I've got this um, two by two classification and uh, and then that means there's, um, there's, there's four overall categories. Um, when it comes to the, um, uh, the, the two kinds of reformist discourses, uh, the, the prosaic reformist essentially taking the, the chessboard as given, if you like, um, there are there are three kinds there. Um, if, uh, uh, there are three kinds there, emphasizing um, respectively um, administration, the administrative state, as being the appropriate response to in, environmental concern, and I call that administrative rationalism. If we want to see administrative rationalism in practice today, uh, we should look to China, where you have uh, a, a strong centralized state. Um, and organizing, amongst other things, um, environmental policies, so regulation, uh, for, for example. Um, the second kind of uh, 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 problem-solving discourse uh, is economic rationalism, and that's uh, uh, that's that. This is where the economists come in and say, "Oh, we just need to put a price on environmental goods. Uh, we need to set up markets." Uh, so market environmentalism. Uh, uh, Markets in, markets in environmental goods. So uh, markets in the right to pollute, for example, uh, markets in um, offsets for uh, if, if you're uh, uh, polluting with greenhouse gases, you can buy offsets to uh, you know, plant forests to, to make up for that. These are, these are all kind of market exchange uh, solutions. And then the, the third problem solving discourse is what I call democratic pragmatism. And that's uh, um, that's relying not on administration, not on markets, but um, on essentially on uh, democratic processes. And those processes might involve uh, conventional processes, of, say, of parliamentary democracy. They might um, involve uh, more innovative uh, forms of well, democratic innovations, which I've had a lot to do with in another part of what I do, which is not necessarily all environmental. Um, uh, democracy. Uh, I, I work on the theory and practice of democracy as well as uh, as, as well as. Uh, environmental governance um, and so this this would involve um, uh, democratic uh, democratic innovations and, and they, they might involve uh, oh, uh, things like citizens assemblies citizens juries that, that can uh, uh, that can promote the involvement of uh, of, of ordinary citizens uh, in, in environmental governance so those are the those are the problem-solving discourses then 
another kind of reformist discourse, which I call uh, well reformist imaginative in uh, in this uh, two this sorry this two by two classification. Uh, uh, the, 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 these are the, the discourses of sustainability, and the reason I'd categorize these as imaginative is that up until the uh, up until the the nineteen well let's say the, the mid nineteen eighties, it, it was widely rec it was generally recognized that when it came to environmental policy and politics, uh, you, there was a, there was a trade off between material growth and environmental protection. You you uh, if you wanted more of one, uh, you had to have less of the other, and what sustain what what the discourse of sustainable development in particular did in the hands of uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland um, this famous report um our common future in 1987 um uh said uh well essentially assumed it didn't it, it didn't say exactly why but it assumed that you didn't have to do that uh that you could have both economic growth and environmental protection um, and for that matter you could have justice uh between generations and within generations. So in sustainable development, you could have it all. There was no need to make tough choices. Uh, uh, and that was that, that was really the, uh, the, the, the rise of a very different kind of uh, more imaginative approach to the relationship between economic growth and environmental concern. It doesn't mean that it's right. Uh, it just means that um, it's more imaginative because Brundtland didn't, pr didn't prove, didn't try to demonstrate that uh, that, um, that reconciliation was possible, but only assumed it. Um, and then the other um, sort of variation on that, um, which is in some ways sort of quite close to it, but gets a separate chapter in the book, is um, is ecological modernization, uh, which is very, which is in some ways a sort of a more um, rose sort of a more technical response to the sustainability challenge. Um, you know, the slogan "pollution prevention pays" um, actually gives you a mechanism, whereas uh, sustainable development didn't really do that. So the, the basic idea that technological change can make productive processes more efficient and so contribute to economic growth, but at the same time uh, reduce uh, reduce um, reduce pollution if if they're done right. So that's ecological modernization, and uh, uh, the I should give a nod to the work of um, the Dutch environmental discourse analysis, and really one of the pioneers in this field, uh, Martin Heyer, who did a lot of work on the discourse of ecological modernization uh, back in uh, uh, back in the 90s. Um, then uh, moving to the uh, the other, uh, moving to the radical column, uh, radical and prosaic, um, this is uh, the, the, uh, this is the, the idea here is that um, you can have big changes, but within the but within the chessboard as set that you, that you confront as set by dominant institutions and practices, and so this is uh, uh, this is where what what I call the discourse of limits and boundaries comes in, and this really hit in a big way in the early early seventies with the publication of um, um, a book called The Limits to Growth, uh, which sold several million copies worldwide. And this this basically said, and really this was for, for I think I think for the first time that um, it, it, well it, it tried to show exactly why um, economic growth would eventually hit ecological limits and what would then happen and produced a, a kind of a simulation into the into the future into actually in, into the into the twenty first century uh, of of overshoot and collapse and warned that this was humanity's future um, in terms of. The response that um, accompanied this, it was often, uh, it was it was generally, well, we need just stronger, uh, well, just stronger government control to limit human consumption of resources and human environmental damage. So in that sense, it wasn't very imaginative. It was using the existing instruments of government, um, but using them in a particular way to respect ecological limits and ensure that human activity, human economic activity was controlled within those limits. Um, so that was the the the, the discourse of uh, the discourse of limits as it arose in the the, the nineteen the nineteen seventies, um, generally accompanied by the need for very strong centralized governmental action. Um, a more imaginative radical response. Um, it's what I call green radicalism, and this arose this arises with the uh, well the more radical wing of the environmental movement as it emerged from in the nineteen sixties and continues today and has changed considerably over time, and maybe we'll get to that. Uh, but the, the the basic idea here is that uh, we really do need to change the system in imaginative ways. Um, and what just what the, what change is necessary, green radicals can disagree, but often they're opposed to the basic 
structure of the existing political and economic systems, to the way governments are currently organized, and certainly to the way capitalism is currently organized. Um, so that's um, green radicalism. And then just to make things a bit more complicated still, uh, there is, uh, we, we see a backlash against both the limits discourse and eventually against green radicalism. So the, the backlash against the, the limits discourses is, is what I call, and, and I think I was, I might have been the first person to use, to call it by this name, uh, the idea of a Promethean discourse. I mean, in Greek mythology, um, uh, Prometheus was um, a figure who stole fire from the, the gods and, uh, uh, and then uh, enabled humanity to, uh, uh, it, to, uh, to, to do all kinds of things that could, no, it, it couldn't do without fire. And so uh, Promethean has great faith, or almost unlimited faith in human technology, especially as organized and promoted by, by markets and by capitalism to, uh, uh, to solve environmental problems. So you don't have to worry about limits. There are no limits. Uh, or if there are limits, if things, you know, if one particular kind of resource runs out, you can always use ingenuity, you can make money by finding an alternative to it. Um, so there's, and and also, it also has great faith in technology to be able to um, come up with solutions, say, to, um, uh, to, well, to, to, to climate change, technological solutions that will involve uh, 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 ultimately uh, much less in the way of, uh, uh, well, we'll just we'll just find just uh, more find more profitable ways um, to use technology uh, to uh, to continue economic growth, but without uh, uh, without damaging without 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 uh, further damage to uh, uh, to the to the Earth system. So it has almost unlimited faith in uh, in technology technology ingenuity and markets to be able to solve problems. Um, so, so that was a backlash against. Uh, against the limits discourse. Um, and then green radicalism eventually finds a backlash, and this is this is new to the fourth edition of the book, the most recent edition, um, what I call um, gray radicalism. Uh, this is this is a kind of uh, anti-environmental discourse uh, associated especially with people, like, well, like supporters of Trump in the US. And it, uh, it doesn't care about markets. Uh, it's, it just sees hostility to environmentalism and environmentalists as a as a part of uh, um, as, as a core part of uh, of the political identity of people who subscribe to it. Um, and so, uh, in in the U.S. and in my own Australia, where I live now, uh, this this is reflected, for example, in enormous support for the coal industry, um, even as coal is becoming uneconomic as a source of as a, as a source of uh, as a source of power and requires uh, uh, government subsidy to keep it keep it going, uh, it will still get support from the people from 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 what I call uh, grey radicalism. Grey being understood as a washing out of any shade of green. It's just a matter of the core identity commitment of people who subscribe to that discourse, and it's very powerful um, in in Australia. And you know, it's it, people who adhere to it um, have called for. Uh, well, they, they have no faith in the market. The market has decided in favour of renewable energy, um, but they want government to come in and keep the coal industry going, um, build, well, just subsidise new new coal mines and and build new coal-fired power stations because the market won't. Um, so it's very different from the Promethean discourse in that sense. So sorry, that was a bit of a, a, a mouthful, but uh, uh, but there are uh, there, there are as, uh, you know that that's that's how I see the landscape, and it's become increasingly, you know, as time goes on, it becomes increasingly sort of variegated. No, no, that was a very very interesting because obviously you wrote this book in twenty five years ago. I've I've kind of lived through all this now as well, and I've just seen how things have played out. Like in the workplace, uh, I think back in um, maybe the early two thousand and tens, or an early and like late two thousands, it was very much more on the um, prosaic side and uh market environmentalism where it was like csr you help out your local uh immigrant family or something mm -hmm. like like something very very small and, and not very impactful and now in especially in commerce where like i work in finance and there's a lot more of a shift towards um the sustainability area sustainable development and esg um whether well right. whether that remains to like is actually going to be impactful I, I personally think most of it's greenwashing um it just yeah. sounds nice 
But uh, yep. it's just interesting to see how the discourse overall has the dominant discourse has changed over time, and environment's yep. taking a much more of a central role uh, in people's um, uh, concerns, uh, right. and and also the politicization as well as you mentioned about the grey uh, in, grey environmentalism or well, grey like, grey radical. radicalism yeah, yeah in Australia because yeah. the identity politics has really taken uh, with social media has just exploded um, yeah the silos and and people not communicate and also people are finding in the way people identify like uh it's 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 interesting because i found it in in religion and faith as well where typically like the way i see religion or i was typically meant to be it's, it's like it's a verb it's something you do it's not a social identity so i can say i'm a muslim I, I, which which literally means i submit to god but people use it as a social identity not as a verb and right which is I find I find a very interesting phenomena um, happening more yeah. and more. Um, yeah. And I and I, and, I, and it's the same thing with this identity politics and, and the environmental discourse as well. Many people they're not so concerned with the environment or not. Maybe they are concerned, but because of of how they identify, they're locking themselves into silos and not and not acting yeah. acting right in many ways. Like for instance, when I talk to um, people who are on the right about the environment who are not very disposed to the environment, I make the case that. Look, forget the identity politics for one side. Think about it this way. I say, um, we get our wealth from the earth, right? Like this is how we make, uh, create value, we uh, trade and so on. This is how wealth is generated. If we destroy the environment, we destroy our ability to generate wealth. So it's actually anti-capitalist to, to be against the environment uh, or to not want to take care of the environment because you're just limiting your ability to, to generate wealth in the future anyway by destroying the very resources at your disposal. Yeah. But so I've just found it very interesting how the categories you mentioned, like how they exist and how they've just how dom how the dominant discourses have changed over time. And I want yeah. to ask how, how have you perceived things change? Yes. Yeah. Well, of course there have been enormous changes. But before I get to that, I'll just get to the question. The the, the, the question you raised about identity is 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 interesting because um I mean the identity question I, I stressed was the the one associated with grey radicalism, where especially in the the US and Australia, and maybe Canada too, to a certain extent. Um, it seems that uh, uh, that anti-environmentalism has been assimilated to uh, to to right to a right wing, a, a sort of a hard right wing conservative position. But um, but but when you think about it, that, as you suggested, there's there's no reason why that has to be that has to be the case, uh, and it, it and it didn't used to be the case. Um, I think um, if I if I think back to well, let's go back to um, say around around 1970, the uh, the environmental issue as it arose seemed to cut across conventional left left right uh, left left right um, divisions, and so the um, in in the US uh, the, the the president and, and it remains true to this day the president with the, the best record on the environment um, is Richard Nixon who's a conservative who's a conservative Republican and there was more done under his administration uh, for the environment than any anyone uh, than any, any presidential administration since so um, so it's, so it's a bit um, strange in a way it's a bit unfortunate that in, increasingly um, in the US um, in, in Australia and Canada but also um, I think as you're, you're suggesting um, in in other countries like the UK too, uh, that it it does um, it, it it does now seem to increasingly sort of map on to left right left right divisions that um, you know that a right wing position is is likely to uh, downplay or perhaps even be hostile to environmental concern, um, whereas a, a left wing position is more likely to be uh, uh, pro environmental. But that, it, but it seems to me, as, as, as well as you've just suggested, that that does that logically that doesn't have to be the case, um, and that um, that really, if you're a if if you're a, if you're a conservative and actually care uh, about uh, you know well, conservative, I suppose by definition, sort of tries to uh, uh, preserve the best aspects of the the past while perhaps accepting the the, the need to. Uh, uh, the need to, to change. There's there's no reason why one can't think of uh, of, of of that valued past um, in terms of uh, ecological systems as well as as well as human social systems. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, like traditional conservative poetry about the environment and taking care of nature and and looking yeah. after like like I think in England yeah. the countryside is basically preserved by the conservatives. 
Um, yeah. In essence, yeah. like if you look at the rural towns and all the uh, committees and whatnot, people, the Ramblers Association, all these, all these heritage foundations, they're all conservatives. Um, right. So it's interesting yeah. how uh, online, at least, uh, it looks like the bipartisanship is, is taking a big, having a big impact mm. on how people view these okay. issues. Yeah. Okay. That's in, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but but you also asked me just how things have changed um, since first edition of the book, and they, they've they've really changed a. a a lot as well as all would expect and i'm sure they will continue to change but um so in, in terms of some specific um changes um i mentioned the discourse of limits as it arose in the 1970s and in a way they, that had a peak in the 70s but then kind of fell into it, it its fortunes declined in relation to sustainable sustainable development which um accepted uh the the possibility of um reconciling growth and environmental concern um but then the, the successor to limits was the the idea of planetary boundaries, which uh, which arose um, in in the work of a number of um, a number of, of scientists, and the the idea of um, this is the Stockholm uh, Center. Yeah, Zealand, this is um, yeah. so uh, the well, a number of scientists, including my um, late Australian colleague um, Will Stefan, and then. Uh, uh, Johan, Johan Rockström in in Europe and and just a, a lot of a lot of a lot of colleagues and they um, so they, they present this idea of planetary boundaries and uh, and, and so the, the basic uh, the, the the basic idea of planetary boundaries um, it, it it it's to identify what the scientists call a safe operating space for humanity and so there there are nine there are nine boundaries which um, one, and climate change is only one of them and so the um, the boundary for climate change is set at um, uh uh 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the the atmosphere um that has been already exceeded and it goes up every year it passed yeah, we're at like 420 now ago. i think yeah yeah and so it, keep, it keeps on rising and that's that's really quite in many ways quite frightening but but that's only just what that's only one of the boundaries there are also boundaries for example um nitrogen and phosphorus in in the environment um for ozone the only the only good news story on of any boundary is actually ozone and that's uh, the uh, ozone layer protection, and that's um, uh, as a result of the 1987 uh, Montreal Protocol for uh, protection of the ozone layer. And that's really the own that is still the only success story, unambiguous success story, when it comes to global environmental governance um, on the condition of the Earth system as a whole. Um, and then, but anyway, there are nine, nine of these um, uh, nine, nine of these boundaries, and the idea is that um, humanity should not transgress any of them in order to retain a safe operating safe space within the earth system to avoid avoid the possibility of um, uh, catastrophic change in the um, in the state of the the earth system and so obviously as as boundaries do get um, uh, transgressed then humanity on this account is in is it is in trouble and then in a way this is this, it's a bit different to the to the limits discourse as it arose from to, to the in the 1970s but it's, it's similar sort of similar spirit um it talks of boundaries instead of limits and so that um uh, so that's a big change um and then uh when it comes to the you know the promethean discourse which arose as a as a market-oriented backlash against limits in the 1970s uh, one one interesting um, iteration of that is um, what I call um, Promethean environmentalism, and this is associated with, um, uh, particularly with um, something called the Breakthrough Institute um, in in the US. And this this is people who actually care about uh, uh, in, environmental problems, um, but think that uh, there are high tech solutions. So when it comes to climate change, uh, people associated with Promethean environmentalism will say, yes, climate change is a big problem. We can't just deny it. We can't uh, necessarily just just let the market um, solve it um, instead we have to do things like geoengineering uh, this will this may involve massive government intervention um, so solar radiation management through for example um, injecting uh, uh, sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere on a massive scale in order to um, to block you know, block solar radiation and cool the earth down these are very high-tech solutions they're not market solutions because you will need a massive government structure to implement anything like that so that's a Again, that's that's a relative, that's a, a new, a relatively well, relatively newer, maybe ten, past ten or fifteen years uh, development. So that's changed. Um, uh, sustainable development has changed over time. I think it's become uh, progressively de-radicalized, 
and I, I think a, a lot of um, yeah, a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of big corporations have got on board the sustainable development bandwagon, and often it is greenwashing, uh, and it is it then and, and increasingly emphasizes the economic growth part uh, rather than and somehow you know the the environmental protection part and the social justice parts um, are increasingly uh, you know they 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 they're paid lip service, but somehow they don't it doesn't seem to be taken taken. Uh, Take, taken seriously and so we can see that change over, over time um uh but sustainable development is also in some ways sort of contested terrain so sustainable development um made a big splash um in 2015 with the adoption of the sustainable development goals by the um uh, well by the un and then uh, subsequently adopted by almost every country in the world um and those are, of course, are, well, just very wide ranging, um, and and they 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 do in 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 some ways they also the sustainable development goals also take uh, a, a kind of a kind of neoliberal um, commitment to economic growth for for granted. There's there's no there's no challenge to the to economic growth. Um, there's no mention in the sustainable development goals of anything like limits or, or planetary boundaries, and so in in a sense, you know, they they have, they of course they've got all kinds of things in there about uh, poverty reduction, um, and so forth, all kinds of social goals, uh, but uh, they 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 also embody this uh, this very uh, sort of de-radicalized uh, uh, view of, of sustainability. Um, so so that's that's so that's been a Again, looking at the evolution of sustainable development, it's um it, it has sort of changed um changed over the years. Um, when it comes to green radicalism, I think one one thing we see over the last um, quarter century or so is an increasing focus, explicit focus on environmental justice. Um, and uh, what does environmental justice mean? Well, it, it, of course, it, it means uh, really a, a, a very strong. Uh, Concern with uh, ensuring that um, the, well, the poor and marginalised um, don't continue to suffer environmental damage more than anyone else, um, and it's true as we know that uh, uh, that the, 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 the victims of of, of 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 pollution are much more likely to be poor and marginalised than they are to be you know, the wealthy, confined uh, ways of in, in, avoid environmental damage. So it's, it's that kind of concern, but it's also mm -hmm. a concern. Um, it's also a concern. Um, with uh uh well the, just just with the standing of marginalized groups um so my uh my, my australian well he's now australian he's originally american colleague um david schlossberg has written a lot about um environmental justice um as a um as, as a movement and the increasing scope of its concern um not just with uh justice within uh within human communities uh and not just locally but also nationally and globally um, but also in relation to other, other species um, so the idea of um, multi-species justice um, is now is now talked about um, in terms of how humans live with um, other creatures in uh, in in just relationships in the in the earth system. So that's um, again that's that's been a that's been a, a change. Um, and then the well the um, I talked about grey radicalism. Uh, grey radicalism didn't exist uh, when. I wrote the first edition of the book, and it's uh, it's a, rel a relatively recent development. And I think it's really only, say, the past ten at most fifteen years that um, that it's arisen. And again, it's not arisen anywhere. It's only in uh, um, only in a few countries. Um, and then the uh, the other one thing I haven't mentioned so far is, uh, and I and I deal with this in the the, the very last um, very last chapter of the. The latest edition of the book is um, the, the the rise of the uh, of, of discourse surrounding the concept of the uh, Anthropocene, which is um, again it's something it's a concept that's developed by um, uh, by, by scientists. Um, the idea that the uh, the 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 condition of the Earth system is is changing dramatically, and that. Uh, and this is the and the the formally the terrain in which this is argued is 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 actually the uh, the discipline of uh, geology and geology of course talks in terms of uh, um, eras epochs and so forth um, 
in, in looking at the history of the, the Earth. And uh, the, the the basic idea of the Anthropocene is that it it, um, it, it represent, re represents an emerging new epoch in the Earth system. So the whole, what what geologists um, call the, the Holocene has, is the last 12,000 years or so. And this is an epoch of highly unusual stability in the Earth system. Um, if we you know, think of what happened before the, the Holocene, uh, we, we see enormous variations in average temperature in the Earth system. Uh, we see uh, sea levels uh, much higher or also potentially much lower than they are. They are now. So the Holocene is unusual, an, an epoch of unusual stability. The Anthropocene is what's now emerging as a result of human activity. So it's an epoch of human induced instability in the Earth system. Um, and so that um, uh, uh, that that is uh, it, it. It's it's actually not easily mapped into the existing categorization of discourses that I that, that I that I developed. Um, certainly, some of the people who who subscribe to the um, discourse of limits and boundaries um, also accept the uh, the, uh, the 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 Anthropocene concept. So perhaps that's uh, what it's what it's close to. But it, it involves. Um, um, in some ways, sort of much more sort of holistic uh, look at the, uh, the the conditions of the of the of the Earth system. And if I may ask, which uh, which discourse do you personally um, lend yourself to more so? Yeah, well, good question. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, I suppose um, you know, in the in the book, I, um, I I sort of try to be as detached as possible in presenting the the different the different discourses. Um, and this is partly, you know, the the origins of the the book um, in in the way I taught environmental politics, and and actually the way I see uh, uh, the the way I see the role of the the educator. I, I'm thinking back to um, an exchange I had um, a, a two or three years ago. I was in a, a panel discussion with um, uh, with uh, uh, with and, and one of the other panelists was um, somebody from Extinction Rebellion. And they they asked me, um, so why don't you lead your why don't you lead your students uh, on uh, in protests and uh, you know encourage them to engage in, um, in in activism and and so I say well that's not my role. Uh, the role of the educator is to uh, is to try and open people's eyes. It's not to lead students in any particular direction. Um, that's that's simply not the role. I say not the role of the educator, and so that's uh, that's why I've tried to present things um, in this book. Now, in terms of my other writings, I think it's um, um, it's 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 much clearer where where I where I stand. And in terms of how I would situate myself, um, I'm, I'm actually I've never been a very good activist. But if I were, I would probably be uh, a, I would be a, a green radical activist. And also um, the the I mentioned the the Anthropocene, uh, the rise of the Anthropocene, as as a, as a concept in a discourse, and I've actually played a bit of a part in this myself. I mean, I'm not I'm not a scientist, so I have no no say in in that part of it. Um, but I did I, I did um, uh, write a book uh, that was published um, four years ago with um, with uh, with Jonathan Pickering, and it's called the Politics of the Anthropocene. And so it's trying to figure out uh, well. Okay, let's take this idea seriously. That there is the potential for uh, that there is this uh, new epoch in the Earth system emerging. It's, it's an epoch of um, instability in the Earth system, and it's an epoch in which there is the possibility of catastrophic state shifts in the condition of that Earth of that Earth system. Say a, a, an extremely rapid, uh, say, melting of the of the polar ice caps, um, and that. Uh, and, uh, a, a very rapid rise in um, average global temperatures and all the catastrophic consequences that will come accompany that. Um, so let's take that seriously. And what does that mean for government? And I think it um, it means that the kind of governments that we have now and their core commitments um, and the, the well the kinds of um, the kinds of state the governments of governments of all kinds of states in the world um, and also the kind of market system we have uh, um, we really need to sort of rethink. Those we re, what we really need is the capacity to rethink those basic institutions in the light of the possibility of the of catastrophic uh, state shifts that the arrival of the Anthropocene connotes, and so that um, 
uh, I think that's um, that's an enormous challenge. And I, I think our existing institutions just aren't up to it. Um, uh, states, um, be they democratic states um, or authoritarian states, are often focused on very much on the short term. Uh, you know, the important thing for, for 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 governments in liberal democratic states is to win the next election. And you know, and and if 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 being if 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 environment if good environment policies are part of that, then yes, then do it. But if they're not, then don't do it. And and often uh, um, and and what I see is even environmentally progressive governments um, uh, sometimes uh, if if they think they might lose the next election they think oh let's forget about this environmental stuff um, let's focus on things like the cost of living in the here and now that's what will get us votes to get us over the line in the next election um, and so you often see that I mean um, just just sort of in. Uh, uh, well, a neighbouring country in this part of the world, New Zealand, where we had um, a, a quite a progressive um, uh, uh, Labour government on environmental issues, and uh, um, and then be before there was an election there um, earlier this this year, and the the new leader of the party said, "Oh, let's dump all that stuff. Um, we're going to focus on the the core stuff that really matters to people, and that was things like um, inflation, cost of living, and uh, and it was just really depressing to see." A, a, focus on the immediate short term I mean, it didn't do many good they still lost the election but uh uh but the but, but the idea was that um you know environmental concern was seen as a luxury but it's not um it involves looking ahead uh, uh you know more than just a, a a few years or few months which um which is the unfortunately the incentive um uh, in, in existing states so um so we really do need to think uh i think really 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 rethink um well what are the 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 what what are the, the the core imperatives sort of baked into our existing institutions, um, and how can we how, how can we change those? And, and that's an enormous challenge. Yeah, interestingly, exactly the same thing happened here in the UK um, two years ago when Rishi Sunak came. It was a year and a half. Oh, right. He made a speech about being pro environment and how his little girls care about the environment, and they talk about it all day. And then recently, yeah. <laughs> he relaxes the commitments to net zero. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's so, just. Um, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you feel like we're kind of locked into this short term thinking, no matter what political system we have, whether it's China with the authoritarianism or UK, US, Australia yeah. with democracies, because we have an economic system where you kind of have to grow. If you don't grow, you can't pay off. Well, you can't service your debt, interest debt. And in order yeah. to service that, you have to grow your economy. Like the whole idea of economic growth is that 2% each year, 3% each year, so that you can um, keep growing, yeah. you can service your debts. And when we have this kind of system, which kind of we're kind of locked in to grow, you have to keep growing every single year, and then um, that puts enormous, enormous demands on politicians and and people's in, yeah. in leadership to like to kind of submit to this paradigm. Because yeah. if your if your debtors are hanging over you and saying, "Look, you got to pay up, otherwise you you have to pay up more in the future," it kind of yeah. it makes it very difficult to, no matter what your political system is, to kind of yeah escape that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right. And I mean, the way I see it is when I mean, you have this sort of, of course, tight relationship between the the, the market market economy and, and and government, and they're they're kind of locked into forms of feedback of the kind you you've described that um, that um, government depends on the continued fruits of um, economic growth um, to keep in, investors happy and, um, and 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 so forth. And and so they're kind of locked into the, the, these these sort of forms of feedback. And, but what they what what they miss is the condition of the earth system uh and so they they this 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 kind of um institutional interrelationship of markets and uh, uh markets and governments has developed over the uh well, the past few hundred years i suppose um and, and it's done so in a way which um you know as systematically excludes feedback on the condition of the earth system and so that's why the the, the challenge is so profound because those um th those forms of those forms of feedback um those sorts of institutional structures of markets and uh, markets and states are, are, are so ingrained and uh and uh and i think we do we, we we need to find a way of challenging that and um i i mean i haven't in, in a way sort of my whole career has been sort of looking for the key to uh, uh, to make things better i'm not sure i've succeeded but i'm not sure anyone else has either but um we you know at the margins you can sort of see things which um the sort of institutional innovations which um uh, which might do a better job of thinking about the, the long term and about the condition of the earth system and so i i you know wearing my other hat um 
I, I do a lot of work on democracy and the idea of deliberative democracy in particular. And one, one of the things we, we find um, uh, is that uh, in democratic innovations, such as citizens' juries, citizens' assemblies, which involve uh, uh, convening lay citizens, so not professional politicians, uh, convening um, lay citizens to get them to um, deliberate um, uh, deliberate um, a particular issue or range of issues, uh, we almost invariably find that they they do a, a very good job at anticipating the the long long term consequences because they don't face the immediate pressures of um, of re election that uh, that um, the politicians do and so um, increasing the the role for them in the the political system would be um, would be would be one step forward um, but there's a big sort of note, note of caution here because um, I'm, I'm thinking uh, to back to what happened. Um, um, a couple of years ago um, in France, where uh, uh, President Macron, in as part of his response to um, you know, various waves of protest of the sort that you often get in, in France, um, uh, con convened uh, um, a, a great debate, but also convened a, 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 a citizens' assembly on the climate, uh, an ecological crisis, and uh, and, he, and when he convened it, um, he promised he would take its recommendations seriously and he used the word unfiltered and take them uh, and, and take them forward and consider the embody them in legislation or presenting them uh, to parliament for, for legislation um so what happened the the, the citizens assembly uh made up of more or less randomly selected french citizens um came up with some quite radical recommendations um including for example um, making ecocide a, a crime um of em embodying uh uh, ecological concern is a key principle in the, uh, the French constitution. And and these were too radical for Macron. So he went back on his promise. He he didn't carry them forward. Uh, and uh, so what what to conclude from that? Um, yeah, those are the I think kind of radical can... measures you need because in the, here in the UK, we've got crisis where basically all our water companies, which are privately owned, sold off by Thatcher, um, they've yeah. been dumping sewage into rivers, so now all our most of our rivers are polluted in the UK, and you can't swim in them. Yeah. Before yeah. you could yeah. swim in them, and it's fine, but now you, you get disease. So we've got a massive crisis where um, private actors have just neglected the environment and for a short buck, and they've damaged yeah. the. For, and we, who knows how long it'll take for the systems to kind of cleanse themselves yeah. and yeah. be good again? Uh, and yeah, right. our governments are fearless, and our markets are fearless. Uh, yeah, yeah, which is actually yeah, okay. brings me to my next question. Actually, um, uh, see that we're running out of time. Um, how does one influence environmental discourses? So rather than just you know, it's good to read about them in your book, but if we want to say, okay, I've got something to offer here, I want to have an impact. How can we yeah. you know influence these discourses or create our own or whatever? Yeah, yeah. what are your recommendations? Yeah. Um, so it it depends. Um, I mean, a lot of it sort of depends on on who you are, sort of what so what role you occupy. Um, so, I mean, the most straightforward one is that um, you know, if if you're an activist, you can uh, uh, try and push ideas as well as uh, as as well as uh, you know, uh, say um, as, as 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 well as um, you know, just engaging in an action sort of targeted at protecting a particular piece of land or um, um, or whatever, or, or or trying to get the water companies to. <laughs> Uh, to change to change their ways um it's possible to sort of push push ideas as well as um um a, a, a alongside the uh just the the the, the practical action in um in, in opposing uh or, or promoting a, a particular kind of a particular particular kind of particular kind of development um so um and 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 many uh and, and quite often you see activists doing that so i think of um you know, people I know um, in the say in the Green Party um, um, who are also pushing ideas alongside the uh, as, alongside sort of specific policies or specific actions. Um, the same in in, in the green social movements. Um, uh, but then there are you know there are other roles too, um, and uh, I, I, I mean not just the role of activists, but um, one thinks of. Um, uh, you know, if you're a, if you're a political leader writing a report, um, if you're commissioned to write a government report, so I'm thinking of uh, people like say um, Nicholas Stern in the UK in 2006 who wrote the uh, landmark Stern review on, on on climate change. Now he's got an enormous capacity to uh, influence the, the the terms of political discourse, and in, and in some ways he did that. I mean, he sort of solidified you know, 
concern with the climate as a as a as a as a part of um, as part of political life um, in in the UK. But of course, um, individuals like that are few and far between. Another big example would be um, uh, Grove Harlem Brundtland, who I mentioned, I think I mentioned earlier, who wrote the landmark um, report to the UN in 1987, which established sustainable development as a as a disc as a key discourse on the, the global stage. Um, but of course, uh, people like that are very privileged, and they're very few and far between. Um, uh, it's possible uh, for people, uh, uh, people with money, to um, establish institutes. Of course, part of the problem there is that people with the most money are often uh, uh, thinking about people like the Koch brothers in the U.S. Uh, who have devoted enormous amounts of money to um, to funding climate change denial, for example. Is this like think tanks? Um, but it's possible. Sorry. Is this think tanks you're referring to? Uh, institutes. Yeah, I think well, I think tanks are institutes um, uh, um, or research institutes, whatever, whatever you want to call them. Um, so. Uh, but it's possible to um, establish things on the the, the other side, um, but they, they, they tend to be um, sort of much less well funded. But there, there are things like um, actually thinking back to the, the 1970s, um, uh, the, the Club of Rome, which I think is still still with us, was established as a, as a kind of um, um, it, it's established. It's interesting, established by a group of very wealthy people. Uh, but uh, it also this is what financed the, the original limits to growth report. And so it helped establish um, the limits discourse on the. On, on the global stage. Um, yeah, um, if you're an academic like me, uh, <laughs> it's possible to, <clears throat> to sort of try and crystallize uh, ideas. Um, and some, some discourses actually have um, academic origins. So for better or for worse. So uh, economic rationalism uh, as, as an environmental discourse um, really has its origins in uh, uh, academic e economics. The, 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 the boundaries the planetary boundaries uh, variant of the limits discourse, um, which I mentioned earlier, has its origins in the activities of, um, uh, of, of, of a group of scientists. And so there are, there are things that academics can do to try and um, to crystallize discourses. Um, there, a journal, there are things that journalists can do, um, can choose how to, do, how to describe um, developments. And, uh, uh, and, you know, perhaps rather than um, simply take a discourse of uh, um, rather, uh, well, take a, a, a take it for granted that economic growth has to be the first priority, um, might try and look at, uh, at developments, well, say the way that, the way that, um, you know, the way that you might, the journalists might cover, say, the, uh, the, the current um, uh, negotiations, the, the conference of the parties on the, the UN framework convention on climate change. Um, uh, how journalists might might cover that um, can have an effect on on discourse. I mean, and in, and in some ways, I, I think uh, you know, journalists are, seem to be sort of quite capable of um, seeing through a lot of the the greenwashing uh, and a, lo a lot just a lot of the the communication that's done in really bad faith um, by fossil fuel producers that we see very evident um, um, petro states um, very evident in uh, in the climate change negotiations. Um, and so, so again, there, there are things that um, journalists can do. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, so, in, in, in some, so in many ways, it sort of depends on what role you occupy. Uh, that the way the development of, of discourses is, is, is generally the work of many hands. Although occasionally you get a key person. I mentioned Stern. I mentioned Brundtland, who, who might be able to um, to help change the. Uh, uh, the, the the terms of discourse, and that was uh, very very useful. I think the point you mentioned about um, identify the role you have to play because that's it's about efficiency. You know, like I might not be good at like what you do, and you not be good at what I do, and you have to recognize yeah. that we all have different set of skills. Yeah, we allocate them in the in the best possible way. Um, yeah, no, I've, I've tried being an activist, and I wasn't very good at it. It just <laughs> isn't, isn't me. I don't, I don't have the patience. So. Um, uh, I won't be a good academic. I'm not. I'm not clever enough. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, thank you very much. Uh, I feel like I can pick your brain all day, but um, our time is up. And thank you very much for coming on. Um, well, thank you, and a pleasure. It's, I enjoyed our talk.